the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So I put my post-it notes in my prayer book of what I'm going to preach about, and so I can kind of look through if I lose my, my, my train of thought. Uh, and I kept looking through, and about two sermons ago, I preached on the experience of being a uh, parent on the sidelines. Well, Laura Lee was the goalkeeper for the game-winning goal and compared that to uh, God giving us the freedom uh, to live our lives and how hard it is for God, who has the power to do anything, to stand on the sidelines. And uh, every instinct I had was to run in front of the goal and to uh, protect my daughter from uh, the potential uh, embarrassment or, 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 or sorrow of letting the winning goal go in the, in the net. Then I realized a couple weeks later for Pentecost, I talked about uh, the difference with running with the wind at your back uh, then in your face and, and compare that to uh, when we really feel like we're following the Spirit, when we're listening to the Spirit. Um, and because I know you can't be tired of my sports analogies and my own family's uh, sports accomplishments, and because it's Father's Day and I can do what I want to do, um, <laughs> I'm going to continue. Uh, and I have a confession, uh, which I start a lot of sermons with as well, uh, but like it. 10.09, right before I came in here, I have this app on my phone that's better than the ESPN app for the Washington Nationals, and it tells me exactly what's going on in my son's baseball game, and uh, as I processed in, he was on first base with two outs in the top of the first inning, and uh, uh, they were up 3 nothing. so I'm a little, uh, uh, so Nani asked me why I was breathing so deeply when I was uh, in, in there for our, more, our prayer before we came into the service, um, but that's why. Um, but it's been a, an incredible season for these boys. Uh, about five of them all graduated from St. James, um, uh, either preschool or the elementary, and they've had an undefeated season, and uh, they're uh, the best of friends, and it's really been an incredible experience for them. I mean, they have loved it, and there's been games they should have lost, uh, but somehow at the very end, they pull it out. And we kept saying during the course of the season, you know, a loss wouldn't be the worst thing for them because, you know, it, you learn from losses. Uh, that, uh, that whole... Uh, suffering thing. Uh, we boast in our suffering. But they went undefeated the whole regular season. They got to the tournament. They won the first game. Uh, and then they got down 7-1 to one in the uh, first inning of the second game. And all of a sudden, uh, their shoulders slumped over. You could tell before uh, they even uh, got to the second inning uh, that it didn't look good for them. That they're, uh, they just, all of a sudden, uh, they'd been prepared for success so much uh, that when they dealt with adversity, when they dealt with suffering, uh, they just kind of dug their heads down, slunched over, uh, and they lost by a run. And then uh, we went to North Carolina playing this tournament, and uh, you could just see that it, it continued, that, uh, um, that they just hadn't built up enough of a register of how to deal with adversity to get back up again. And you can see almost like the air going out of a balloon. Uh, it was just constricting. You see them in the dugout, and they were slumped over. Uh, and the, the ball that was as big as a grapefruit was now the size of an acorn every time they got up to bat. Um, and you can see that they weren't quite cheering each other on the same way. And it was really kind of tough to watch. Uh, but sometimes sports are a microcosm for the larger life that we don't get to see uh, as acutely. Uh, but then this thing started to happen where all of a sudden, you know, one hit led to the second. And they realized because of their experience, because of what they'd accomplished, uh, that they had the ability to, uh, to hit the ball deep. That they had the ability uh, to rally together as a team. And all of a sudden you saw them start to put together runs. Uh, and it was just beautiful to see like air going back into a balloon uh, that they started to have hope again. Uh, and the hope became contagious. And you see it in the whole dugout where they're patting each other on the back and, uh, and they're screaming and they're cheering each other on. And you think, why doesn't the world at large look like that? Why don't you see that on Main Street uh, when there's just an energy uh, and a sense of uh, the need for hope uh, and the hope to be contagious and the hope to draw upon previous experience of something in your life that you know is true and you can hold on to? Uh, and when they won the game, I mean, the exact exhilaration, uh, probably greater than any of the other victories early on because they dealt with suffering. And I think there's a profound truth uh, that Paul understood when he boasts in his suffering. And he says suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope, and hope never disappoints. And I think every one of these readings are about hope. 
We were talking about it Thursday, and how do we find hope amidst uh, the cloudiness of the world we live in? On a little league field in Alexandria, uh, we had another reason to lose hope. It wasn't even the most violent crime committed that day. Another reason to lose hope. Every time we turn on the TV, it seems like we have another reason to lose hope. But each one of these readings gives us a glimpse as to why and how we hold on to something deeper uh, than what the news report indicates. How we fill up that balloon, how we fill up our soul with a sense uh, that, that this is not the way the world is. That there is more at play uh, than what we can experience. How do we get a collective locker room enthusiasm or dugout enthusiasm uh, that we can do more uh, than, than what we see outside these doors? We have that first story uh, about Sarah, and Sarah hasn't quite had the same experience of Abram. Abram had God come and talk to him. God promised uh, that his ancestors would outnumber the, the stars. Sarah was kind of along for the ride. She got uh, uh, handed over to the Pharaoh, uh, uh, told that it, uh, uh, they decided to, to tell the Pharaoh that it was Abraham's sister. And so uh, he, she ended up getting married off and then sent back. Uh, and then uh, Abraham was a promise that his ancestors would outnumber the stars. Uh, but the first child uh, and children uh, were born from uh, the handmaiden and, uh, and, and Sarah, whose, whose self is wrapped around her ability uh, to bear children, uh, suffers uh, well into her 90s, uh, 90 years without being able to see the fulfillment of this promise. So her register is not filled with reasons to believe in hope. Her register is not filled with the experience of God coming into her life uh, and showing her and being uh, that hope that she needed. And so she laughs, she scoffs. Abram in the previous chapter scoffs as well. He just doesn't get called out on it quite as uh, uh, much as, as, as Sarah does. Um, but why do we have hope? What gives us hope? Our hope is girded in the experience of knowing that God entered the world in human form. That God, even as God himself, God incarnate, was nailed to the cross as the sky turned dark. That there was a light, a work in the world, a force that was at play that was beyond our understanding, beyond our ability to comprehend. And I think the one thing that the church can offer the world is hope. Hope that this is not the trajectory of the world, that the world is indeed good, that there are forces in the world that move towards goodness, towards building up the vision of God for creation. And I think that's our responsibility as God parents. I think that's the responsibility uh, of members of the church to point towards that greater vision. Martin Luther King, uh, uh, who actually took the quote, um, uh, described the universe this way. He said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I think the same is true for, uh, for life in general, that uh, the course, uh, uh, the trajectory of life is long, and there are a lot of things uh, that are discouraging, but the arc of the world bends towards God and God's kingdom and God's will and God's purposes. Uh, but there's a difference between what we wish for and what we have enduring hope in. I wish that people would stop killing each other because of our differences. I wish nooses would stop showing up at the uh, African uh, American History Museum. I wish that people on both sides of the aisle would stop yelling back and forth at each other. I wish that we would raise our children in a world that is unified and collective uh, and seeks the common good. But my hope is in the love of Christ poured into our hearts. My hope is different than my wishes. Because hope is participatory. Hope, like the kids in the dugout, require all of us uh, to share in it, to believe in it, and to hold it, and to act it. Hope is longitudinal too. Hope doesn't just come by waking up the next day and uh, assuming the world's going to be different. It's seeing things in a long trajectory and being part of that trajectory. I also think hope requires us to have a narrative and an experience of something more, a register of things that are filled with opportunity, things that point us towards a greater truth. When Jesus sent his disciples out, he said, it's going to be hard. 
And why on Father's Day we have this whole passage about uh, parents rising up against their children uh, and children rising up against their parents, I'm not quite sure. They could have put that in July sometime. Um, but he says it's not going to be easy. But I've shown you how much I love you. I've shown you the power of God to do anything. And I've given you all the things that you need. And we go back to that letter from Paul. Boast in your suffering. Boast in falling down and getting back up again. Boast in scraping your knee, wiping it off and getting up. Boast in those disappointments that led you to greater hopes and greater horizons and greater skills and greater learnings. Because our sufferings produce endurance. Our endurance produces character. And our character produces hope. And hope never disappoints. And so as we baptize Henry today, we baptize him into the body of hope. Into that promise. Into that prayer that we'll pray for him. That he has the courage to will and to persevere. And the spirit to know and to love you. And a gift of joy and wonder in all your works. We pledge that he'll see the world differently. Not the way it might be in the first inning, but the way it could be in the sixth. Not the way the world looks outside these doors, but the way that God can make the world work if we all have that courage and will to persevere. Amen.